Japan, we took on the King of England, to the Taming of the West, to the heroic role in two world wars. Then there was John Wayne, Butch and Sundance, Bonnie and Clyde, Al Capone, Rambo. But in recent years, there has been a terrifying escalation from toughness to cold-blooded and mindless violence, not just on the big screen, but on the streets, in high school hallways and classrooms. What we have always thought of as sanctuaries have echoed the sounds of gunfire, and people have died. Then last month in Los Angeles, it seemed as if guns were everywhere. During the rioting, looters targeted the gun stores, stealing some 2,000 weapons. Frightened by the rioting, Californians bought more than 40,000 new guns. And even before the riots in the past five years alone, residents of Los Angeles County bought a half a million guns. Why are we so violent? Why do we have such a love of guns? What is it in our history that has made us the world leader in death by violence? NBC News and USA Today have been looking into those questions, and tonight, we begin our report in Oakland, California. Let's talk about what's real, what's going on out there. The only thing I'm going to cause harm to is the son of a bitch that took my son out. I gotta take my daughter to school every morning. I'll be scared to walk past there because I may get shot. I live day by day, whatever happens, whatever happens. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people out there that's angry and they don't know who to take it out on. This is too much trouble in Biden say where you go. They shoot like this in broad daylight. How am I gonna think positive right. when there's all this mess going on around me? Positive ain't where I live. The Bay Area of Northern California. Tension is in the air. Communities are on edge. It's a war right here, you know? We don't have to go to Desert Storm. We got the war right hey. here. In Oakland, there have been a record number of homicides, more than 90 since January. Many have been committed by juveniles. Oh, yeah, the gun, hey. Uh, bop, bop, yeah. bop. Gumby is 18. Yeah. He calls himself a gangster, a gangbanger. Fight one-on-one -on -one no more. Before we spilled a fight one-on-one, -on -one. now, just, you know, what's up, what's up, oh, what's up, bop, bop, bop. We've learned to fear young men like Gumby because he is not afraid to be violent. We ain't got no money, man, I ain't gonna lie, you know. God forgive us, you know, but we ain't got no money. We gonna knock someone out, you know, roll them up for their wallet or their Rolex or their rope or something. Gumby says he owns these streets, but even he doesn't feel safe on them. He abruptly stopped talking when a suspicious car drove by. These fools right here drove by, they stabbed me on Thanksgiving. I'm standing here with no gun on me, but I'm going to the house. Gumby's world may seem like madness to us, but to him, it is everyday life, part of a bigger picture. We'll go back onto the streets of Oakland when America the Violent continues. That does not excuse their viciousness, of course, but to understand their behavior, we do have to understand their desperation. We have to learn how to give them hope and direction. I prefer a 9mm. It reacts real quick. A 16-year-old drug dealer. Somebody come past shooting. Pow, 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 pow. I can just move to the side and pull out my 9mm. I get right off at him. He, he broke his hip, and he broke his ankle, and he broke his wrist. He's 17. He threw a boy over a cliff. He says he learned from his uncles. They said there ain't no rules in fighting. They do anything at all to my family. Then, then... I have no choice but to get them. Not just them, not just the family, the relatives, you know, anybody else they love. An 18-year-old Asian gangbanger. Some people just put you down, you know, because of your race or how small you are. You gotta let them know they, they can't just punk you like that. You, you, gotta, you gotta do something about it. Oakland, California, just across the bay from San Francisco. Oakland has its own sparkling skyline and an interracial middle class but a troubled soul. The inner city is sick with crime and poverty. Whole neighborhoods are killing grounds. Now the schools not only have the traditional memorials to those who died in world wars, but new makeshift memorials to those who died in street wars. Guns are everywhere. 29 have been confiscated in Oakland schools just this year. The police chief. Here you're looking at something that makes no sense. People are killing each other for nothing. For nothing. And that's the, how in the world you deal with that. Many of the victims and their killers are very young. Teenagers and younger. We think they kill for nothing. But they see the world very differently. No 
These are the members of Familia del Norte, Family of the North, one of the thousands of gangs that have terrorized California cities. They take refuge in each other. They say all they have is their turf, their families, and they protect them with enough firepower for a small army. How many of you have ever carried a gun? They're too smart to show us their guns. That would land them in jail, but they can get them anywhere, anytime. 20-year-old Style got one, and he used it. All me and a lot of friends, we was at a party, and um, some uh, guy from another clique came to the party, act like he was bad, and he was supposed to fight one of my homies. And um, he pulled out his cuete, his gun, but um, little did he know that there was a lot of people there who had their guns too, and he came up short. Style is remorseless, and if he goes to jail, he says he can handle it. You gotta do what you gotta do. Take care of business. Style, like so many gangbangers, is a maddening combination of cold-blooded gunmen and lost potential. He's a talented street artist. He does t-shirts, tattoos, and walls, but he has no hope. Wouldn't you rather spend time doing your artwork? If I could, I would. But, uh, no, that's like a fairy tale story. No, that's... That's fake fiction. This is real life living out here, you know? I'm not at some big construction company designing buildings or something. They are angry and they feel cheated. It does not excuse their crime, but it explains their lack of compassion. How do you guys think that the rest of the world views you guys in this neighborhood? We don't That's care what the, world, what the rest of the world think about us. I don't care you what know? the rest of the world think they about don't care me. What they doing for me? Gumby is typical. Gumby's father was a gangbanger. He's been in jail for murder since Gumby was a baby. What Gumby knows now is mugging and robbing. That's his trade. He's learned it on his own. Is there anything you wouldn't do because it's wrong? Is there anything I wouldn't do because it's wrong? I wouldn't rob an old lady. Yeah, I don't ladies home. I wish they were different. I wish they had more compassion. If those kids' environment was different, a lot of them wouldn't be there today. A lot of them would probably be practicing for track or at home or in a library studying so they can pass those college entrance ex examinations, you know? But they don't think nothing about that. They don't think about that at all. Hey, muchacho. Here you go. Tomas Delgado, a mailman, is trying to change the lives of Gumby and the others. He and his wife befriended the gang members and tried to start a neighborhood theater. But like so many well-meaning projects, it folded when promised rehearsal space failed to materialize. You know, what do you want with your life in the future? You know, you're not always going to be kids. I know a lot of other people in the community you look at them and say, well, hey, you know, look at all them bad kids over there, you know, but they don't see beyond that. They don't see the potential that they have that, you know, all they need is a break. The problem is that breaks and good deeds have to compete with gunfire and gang banging. In the Oakland gang wars, police estimate that at least 85 gang bangers have been killed and more than 63 wounded in the past two years. Tomas Delgado ended up in the middle of it. Because of his association with Familia del Norte, he and his family became a target of rival gangs. And they were actually like getting down, aiming in like they were at a pistol range or something, you know, taking their time, squeezing the rounds off like they, you know, they didn't have a care in the world, you know. That really scared me because it showed me that they weren't scared. But he refused to become a statistic. He grabbed his gun and he returned fire. And a young gangbanger was wounded. And for what? Who's going to gain anything out of that? Nobody. Everybody loses. Since that first attack, shots have been fired into Delgado's living room. He can't sleep. He now keeps guns close at hand. He is now part of the cycle of violence. Things have changed, you know. I was really dead set against the gang mentality, but I know now that if you don't show these other groups that, you know, you have something backing you up, they'll continue to harass you. And all the gangs have something backing them up, more and more firepower. In Oakland, a lot of guns come from Nevada and Colorado where registration requirements are minimal. They keep coming in and Oakland cops keep impounding them. 3,000 so far this year. Sergeant Rob Stewart says they can't keep track of all the guns out there, thanks in part to the powerful gun lobby. State legislation has banned us from uh, keeping any official 
files on any rifles or firearms, and there is no mandatory registration on uh, concealable firearms. So there is no database or any record keeping on the amount of firearms that are in any particular community. A lot of those concealable firearms are high-powered pistols, and a lot of them are stolen. The stolen firearm may travel through 15 to 20 uh, hands in a year's period of time uh, before we finally confiscate it uh, in a search warrant or used in a crime. The cops simply can't keep up however long they stay on the streets. Too many guns, too many kids who are growing up with a mindset of kill or be killed. Mike Gumby, shot in the back just four months ago. How much think I'm gonna die? Yeah. They'll probably shoot me or stab me. One of the two. You're just playing with me. I ain't playing with you, man. One of the two, huh? Why do you say that? See, your friends, they be dying of old age with cancer and heart attacks and all that. Not my friends, man. My friends get shot, shot down. It is very difficult to reach the Gumbies of Oakland's inner city. People like Tomas Delgado try sometimes by just listening to the anger that boils over. Listening, like a radio show that tries to reach the toughest of the gangbangers from its studio across the bay in San Francisco. God, God. They're pointing a gun on me. Mm. I could be lying there bleeding. You're right, baby. You're right. Money and bitches. That's all I live for. I'm down for money and bitches, all right? What was that money going to do for you when you're dead? By your nice casket. Street Soldiers is a weekly call-in radio show. It opens its lines to street kids, the hardcore cases, and the people who are worried about them. My brothers that's gangbanging, and they need to stop that, man, because we killing our own race, blood. You know what I'm saying? Its manner is frank, confrontational. This call from a boy threatening gang retaliation. We set up a fight, but they don't show up. Wait, 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 wait. Now, what's the point? What are you setting up a fight for? Try to get it over with, handle this. To try, you, you said, do, you, do you actually think that's going to handle it? Be honest. I don't know. Guess so. You don't know. Well, you, I don't know. Guess so ain't good enough. If you don't plant the seeds, nothing will grow. You know, we had a call one time when some guy said he was carrying a gun because uh, uh, he wanted to have it in case somebody popped in. You know, then we had six callers call in and say, look, I've done the same thing. That doesn't work. Co-host Joe Marshall is a teacher. He works with at-risk students and delinquents. You know, I'm the, the gang up in 415 Oakland. Well, they want me to join them. Nobody will tell them, hey, I know you're not happy, man. You know, you can't really get what you want. You could be smoked at any minute. You could die. You could be in jail. You know? I mean, I, I, I've just seen it happen too many times where guys say, I don't really want to do this. I mean, they really don't. They just don't know what else to do. What Joe does is invite them to the Omega Boys Club to learn more about self-awareness self-esteem, to hone their reading and writing skills. Nobody's going to see this but you and me, okay? I call a boys club and the new extended family. So what we say is, no matter what your situation is at home, whether you, you don't have a father, you know, even now you, you may not have a mother, we'll be your parents. And being your family means everything that we can give, everything from a pair of shoes, you know, to help with a college education. Joe Marshall isn't kidding. Through their efforts, which include raising money from sporting events and from business and private donations, the club has sent more than 100 of these at-risk teenagers to college. A former gangbanger and drug dealer, Joe Collins is aiming to get his high school diploma next year. Sometimes I'll be like, man, I don't even feel like going to Omegas today. My buddies be, they out there selling dope, and they don't want to see me go back down to where they at. And so they had that respect for me. They'd be like, Joe, man, we'll give you a ride up to Omegas. Go ahead, how much money you need to get on the bus? Now, my, my question, my question was, how is joining a gang going to help you? You in school? I go when I feel like it. Oh, okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's, I'm going to tell you right now, that's a mistake right there. I don't believe in neutrality. You can't be neutral with this. Besides, what do we have to lose? Nothing's working anyway. <laughs> We're building more jail. Fact, the nationwide unemployment rate for Hispanic teenagers, 23%. For blacks, 40%. Fact. Death by violence is the leading cause of death for black males under the age of 18. When we come back out of the ghetto into America's heartland for a look at our national love affair with John. It's always been a family tradition, like especially on Christmas. Uh, women fix the dinner and we go shoot.
If you're using a credit card to get a cash advance, you're probably getting soaked. Because ordinary cards charge you interest. Right from day one. Which is why you should use the Discover card. Just pay your full monthly balance and a small transaction fee, and we'll give you cash, interest-free. So you can avoid taking a bath. It pays to Discover. Country Crock Churnstyle? Churnstyle. That sweet, buttery taste reminds me of dinner on the farm when we melted butter over fresh-picked corn and spread it on oven-warm bread. Only the taste of sweet butter would do. Now it's the sweet, buttery taste of churn style. Come try the sweet, buttery taste of Country Crock churn style. Like regular Country Crock, it has fewer calories and no cholesterol. It's that sweet, buttery taste from the farm. It's hard to describe when you hold your child for the very first time. You feel that little hand, you hear that little cry, you realize you're responsible for someone else. It changes your priorities, it even changes what you drive. The 1992 Toyota Previa, along with standard driver's side airbag and optional anti-lock brakes, it's the only van to meet all passenger car federal motor vehicle safety standards. Toyota Previa. Changes everything. Pour on the cheddar and make it taste better. Potato? Dull. With cheddar? Delicious. Anybody want chip? No. no. Well, how about some cheddar cheese nachos? Yeah. Right. With your vegetables? Oh, no. With cheese? Oh, great. The great taste of cheddar makes everything taste better. You know how to keep your lawn beautifully green, even in a heat wave? That the founding fathers were concerned about, but a lot of Americans are determined that the right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed in any fashion whatsoever. The American love of guns goes well beyond the Second Amendment. It is a legacy of the frontier West, still alive and shooting in 1992. Fear or fun? Hey, it was my can. Come on. To folks like Dan Howard, his wife Linda, and son Brian. You can see it. Guns are fun. <laughs> oh, it's such an adrenaline rush. Your pulse rate's up, everything's cooking. <laughs> the Howards have the gun fever that grips millions of American families. Okay, take a big deep breath, let half of it out, and then squeeze easy. Ow. Huh? Every year, nearly four million guns are manufactured for the U.S. market. National forests echo the volleys of recreational shooters. Urban gun ranges are busy all day long. I've never taken anybody shooting that didn't like it. This is fun. I think this is so fun. It's weekend family fun. In our family, it's the gun activities are definitely a bond. Linda Howard, stitching a holster for one of the family's dozen old-style western six-shooters. Son Brian and Dad, Dan Howard, reloading old-style black powder ammo and reacting to criminals who use modern guns to kill. They just gave guns a bad name. Hmm. I think guns don't have to be a bad thing. You can easily see it's part of our heritage. Uh, it's always been a family tradition. Over here, Brian. This is Grandpa's old gun. I'm going to shoot black powder. Black powder. And it's going to be a little bit more recoil a little bit more fire. But it's like shooting a 38? A little bit more than a 38, but you can huh? handle it. Whew, that thing almost flew out of my hands. It went a little bit over the top. Take your time. Got him. Oh. Smells wonderful. When I was a young man growing up in South Dakota, guns were a very important part of my life. I, I thought of guns, I guess, as my birthright. A lot of years ago, of course, but even now, when I come back to a shooting range, my old interests are reawakened. The problem is, of course, that these days, this kind of shooting is lost in the understandable national concern that we have about the wanton and gratuitous use of guns in the inner city, where guns are used only to kill people. I think it's very frightening, and I, I would definitely be in favor of stronger gun control. But I think we're all a little bit afraid of, of the 
politics that may get involved in, in limiting our our ability to own. You know, it's happened in so many other places. <laughs> The Howards, who say they often long for simpler times, like to dress up in old Western gear. All right. Even use aliases to compete in shootout competitions. Oh. Dan Howard, who's a chiropractor by profession, is known here as Doc Bones. And, and in first place, by the skin of his teeth, is Doc Bones. It's oh. un-American not to want to be a cowboy. Well, that's what we think, anyway. Got it. Dan Howard does stress safety, and it seems to have hit home with Brian. I wouldn't try that. Oh. It's not safe, really. The thing that I think I, I know that other kids should know about is the safety. That's definitely something that there's a problem with. A nine-year-old shot himself. Accidental shooting. Died this morning. A nightmare. Nearly a thousand young Americans are killed in gun accidents each year, and many more are seriously injured. The bullet went in, just ripped his eye, and ricocheted back and forth. Penny Ship had sent her son Daniel to gun safety courses, but a friend picked up Daniel's gun and accidentally shot him. I should never have let him hang his gun on the wall. I was unaware that Daniel had any bullets. Hundreds of adults are also killed in gun accidents every year. Even safety-conscious hunters, about 150 annually, most of them mistaken for games. But gun lovers insist guns are not too dangerous. I think they're fun. You can shoot things with them. Daniel still has his gun. In small towns like Prescott, Arizona, the gun culture thrives. 38 special. Bucky O'Neill's gun shop. My grandson, he really likes to shoot, and he's only eight years old. George Burns has been shooting since he was eight. It's cheap. It's a lot better than going to pick the show or going out and eating, something like that. That costs a lot of money. When I shoot, it doesn't. To Eric Dennis, shooting guns are becoming a way of life. Well, I take great pride in some of the ones that I've built, like, like this one. I work construction. I was a jeweler for a while, and I just don't get the same gratification I do is, is working with the, with the gun. Eric has gone back to school to become a gunsmith. A degree in gunsmithing? Here at Yavapai College in Prescott, students learn the old handcrafted methods. Across town, the Ruger gun factory. Here too, each gun is built from scratch. Quality guns that never wear out. But today and every day, these workers don't go home until they've made a thousand guns and test fired them all. New and improved designs keep people buying. Uh, we make the best. Company founder Bill Ruger is a power in the gun industry. This plant produces automatic handguns, often used by law enforcement and for self-defense. But an even larger factory turns out nearly a half million rifles and shotguns annually for sport. To ride to shoot, to tell the truth. That was the law of ancient youth. Old times are past, old days are done. But the law runs true, a little son. Ruger admits fewer modern day sons inherit that proud tradition like his sentimental view of the Old West. I know there is a big city problem. Do you worry about this building a kind of backlash? That's the least of it. What I love, and what I've been doing for a living, is part of America that I want to say, stay put. But you would have no problem if I wanted to buy this weapon. And they said, we're going to give a five-day waiting period. We're going to put you through a computer check. We want to know who you are, what your past is, and so on. That seems reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. This progressive view makes Ruger an outcast to hardliners here at the National Rifle Association convention. The NRA found itself in a real street fight here guns are considered a birthright and people like nra boss wayne lapierre reject any gun control firearms have never been the problem but no one is saying you ought not to be able to own a gun i i, I would disagree with that i mean the fact is if you look at the, this debate what they're really proposing now is to tear a hole in the bill of rights but the gun culture does have a seamy side 
you're normally able to find about what you want at a gun show. Terrence O'Malley is a gun dealer and a private investigator hired by NBC News to observe this North Carolina gun show. At this show, the NRA had a display. So did the federal government's gun enforcement agency. But if you knew what you were doing, you could buy an illegal weapon. These are not recreational guns. Dealers stay barely within the law by selling all but one part of an illegal automatic weapon. You've got all the full auto except for the lever. The lever. You know where I could get a lever? I'm sure there's some dealers here that have levers. That's a common part. It's just that's the part we have chosen not to carry. Right. It bothers me a great deal that there are people out there that have machine guns, grenade launchers, uh, things that have a no sporting purpose that I'm aware of. All righty, hit him out. Dan Howard and his family realize guns in the wrong hands are tearing a hole in society. My feelings about the NRA is that sometimes they can be a little bit overboard. You know, we, we all have to use common sense. The common sense to somehow limit the availability of guns to outlaws the common sense to allow good guys the sporting use of guns. It's hard for me to think that the American people will ever let our cowboy heritage die. Fact, there are over 60 million legal handguns in America today more than 200 million legal guns of all kinds. Fact, the odds are better than 40 to 1 that a gun kept in the home will kill a member of the family or a friend rather than an intruder. When we come back, a look at violence in the media. Did the movies and television make us do it? to blame? Or is it the people behind the guns? Can solutions be found down the barrel of a gun or in the eyes of its possessor? And we'll explore the violence here at home tonight on Channel 5, the Texas News Channel. David Gold and Bob Ray Sanders debate solutions to violence after the game. There is no way to quantify it, but almost all of us get daily doses of violence in our exposure to music, newspapers, movies, and of course television. You can't measure cause and effect, but one survey estimates that the average American 18-year-old with average American viewing habits has seen 200,000 acts of violence, and that's on TV alone. Fourteen-year-old girl. Police are looking for two women who have taken a life. Ain't nothing but a killing for a brother. Life with it being a young black villain. He'd lock himself in somewhere. I couldn't get into his room. You know, I had no idea what was going on in there. Every once in a while, I'd beat on doors like, turn that stuff down. You know, I never even heard the words. Debbie Riley's youngest son was no longer her little boy. Eric hardly spoke to his mother. It was just his friends, his room, and his music. Heavy metal. For me, I was depressed a lot, you know, because I was with my father when he died. And, and there was one song that really played into it. It was uh, Metallica's Fade to Black. And that talks about, you know, there's nothing more in life. In 1985, the Rileys moved from California to the sleepy town, Fort Mill, South Carolina, population 5,000. One reason, says Debbie, was to get away from drugs and violence. But it was here that Eric and his brother Heath found their music and their lifestyle. I remember one time this guy was running off his mouth while we was down at a friend of mine's house, and 
me and my buddy just pulled out our pistols and just started firing at him, you know, just to scare him off. It was just like we took up the whole street, just shooting down the road. I was afraid of Heath. I never was afraid of Eric, you know, because it always seemed like you could get Eric with a hug. You could get a hold of Eric. He was still within reach. But Heath, it was like I'd reach out to him, and it was like, like I told you before, like I was the enemy. And this favorite name for me, you want it? <laughs> he used to just call me, you bitch. I hate your guts, you know, and throw me up into a wall. There's only one way I can make it right. Mama's got to die tonight. Heath and Eric left heavy metal behind when they came to the school for troubled teens in upstate New York. That music's not allowed here. Heath is now a staff member, but he still remembers his enchantment with guns. If so-and-so wants to mess with me, you know, well, he can mess with this first, you know. It's just that kind of an attitude. It's very powerful knowing that you've got something that can actually take somebody's life just like that, and you don't have to do nothing, just pull the trigger. You know that you can just lay somebody on the ground just like that, and they won't get back up. It's pretty wild. Talk to me softly. There's something Seductive imagery in music and movies conceals the truth about violence, says Harvard's Dr. Deborah Prothrow-Stiff. We've learned that it's entertaining and that it's glamorous and that the hero can successfully solve a problem that way. The reality is violence is painful. Tragic rarely does it solve a problem. <laughs> It's just like if you eat the wrong food, they'll kill you. If you're eating the wrong music and the wrong books and seeing the wrong things, it'll destroy you one way or the other. It'll destroy your innocence. And innocence is what's being lost in their generation, and it's sad. It's a lifestyle, man. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and violence. It used to be just sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but now it's violence. America's infatuation with violence may have started with the media, Go ahead. Make my day. But it quickly spread to the top. Go ahead. Make my day. Reagan was the make my day president, and Bush is now the kick butt president. Again, you know, it's the tough guy, I'll beat you up, but also, I want to beat you up. I, I'm looking forward to beating you up. That's fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> Trails, Hans. And we have become less sensitive. It takes more blood and more guts to satisfy today's audience. Compare the body count in Die Hard and its sequel, Die Harder. Jamie Foster Brown publishes a music industry magazine called Sister to Sister. She's been fighting brutality in music for years and prints lyrics that are flagrantly offensive. Girls think lesser of themselves than that hoe. Everything is bitch and everything is hoe. And they think of themselves that way. And then the boys think of girls like that. What kind of family life are we going to have with these kids? <laughs> Jamie prides herself on what she calls her five-star family. Her husband, Lorenzo, a government economist. Her sons, Russell and Randall, good students, good kids. But the violence Jamie writes about came crashing home in January when Randall's date was assaulted by an old boyfriend. And that boy's friends kept Randall from helping her. Jamie's nightmare started with a phone call. I take the phone and I said, she says, Mrs. Brown, your son has had an accident. This is the Fairfax Hospital calling. And as soon as I got out of the car, two guys stepped up to me. And, uh, right here? Right here. One was about right here, one about right here. And uh, the first guy said, do you have something to do with this? And, uh, and I said, no. And she said, well, he's critical. He'll probably have to go into surgery. He struck me across the jaw. We struggled for a little while. I hit him across the jaw. He stepped to about right there. I went to fight off the second guy. 
And that's when I was shot then. By the time Randy was able to get back in the car, he was shot four times. Through the leg, through the arm, in the back, and through the liver to the heart. Remarkably, Randall was able to drive across the road to a telephone. I was kind of hobbling, yeah, because uh, all my joints were stiff. I got my leg and my arms were hanging. So I pretty much went over to the phone here. And, uh, and I had a hard time holding it up, especially after a while after the policeman kept talking to me. So I was basically like this. Randall's life was saved in emergency surgery. He's doing fine now. The 18-year-old boy who shot him has been convicted and awaits sentencing. Randall says he's not angry. I feel that to do something like that, he must have been a victim of something. Therefore, I can't put all the blame on him. One, two, three. Can we put some of the blame on the media? The experts say yes. When that stage was set and everyone was there, there was expectation around violence. There was, from, from movies, from music, uh, a sense of excitement and, and glamorization and, and justification of the violence. The more blood flew, then he disappeared. Then my boy... Since her son's shooting, Jamie's fighting harder than ever. Here, she is chairing a panel at a recording industry convention. The creators of heavy metal and rap are the world's first TV generation nurtured on a steady diet of fictional and non-fictional mayhem. When you tell a parent to shut something off that the child shouldn't hear, that's, that's impossible today. You got Walkmans, you got portable televisions, you got kids that making cassettes and stuff. I mean, it's just impossible for a parent to police a child like that. The, me the media has totally permeated our society. Violence is really stupid, and it's amazing that our entertainment industry and our marketing industries are so good that they can take something that's stupid, ridiculous, not successful, uh, and, and make it so glamorous. If you like rap music so much, how come you ain't smiling? I'm smiling. Smile, smile real big. And let's thing. do a rap together. Yo, baby, yo, baby, yo. Yo, baby, yo, baby, yo. Say, ow. Yeah, ow. I just have miles to go before I sleep. In fact, the United States has the highest percentage of households owning firearms, followed by Switzerland, which after all has a large reserve army. Canada, Finland, and France in order. Fact, even though those other countries have lots of guns, we kill a lot more. The gun homicide rate in the United States is 11 times that of Switzerland, more than five times higher than Canada, nine times higher than Finland, twice the rate in France. When we come back, the experts on guns and violence and death. Brokaw Report, America the Violent, sponsored in part by the makers of Lincoln Town Car, Continental, and Mark 7. Lincoln, what a luxury car should be. It says people kill people. Uh, no, I, uh, I think guns play a significant role, and there have been comparison studies um, that suggest that the presence of a gun makes a difference. But it's that plus our habit of using uh, the gun. So I think it's a bit of guns and a bit of people and a bit of movies and what I call our make my day ethic here in the United States. And all of those pieces are important. Colonel Sapinski, the NRA says it's more important than ever now that citizens have the right to quickly arm themselves and that they should be buying more guns, not fewer. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. Uh a gun is necessarily going to solve your problems, and in many cases, it may even cause more problems. Mr. Stilwell, how would you respond to that? Well, I would respond by saying that uh, guns are an appropriate part of our culture. I think that they're very misunderstood. There's no question that they can be very violent and are used violently. But when we look for the easy answer, as uh, Americans are wont to do, we want fast food and easy answers. We look for guns, and that's not true. But the fact is that guns are just too available, and I just don't understand why the responsible gun owners of America would resist a five-day waiting period to send a signal of some kind that we want to get this under control in some fashion. First of all, it's not a matter of a five-day waiting period. If we're talking about having a, an instant check, the technology is there, we have no problem with that. The NRA doesn't have any problem with it. Manufacturers don't have any problem with it. Let's get the people who shouldn't have guns to not have guns. 
I want to I want to beg to differ with uh, Mr. Stillwell on this because the NRA does have a problem. Your incoming president is Bob Corbin is quoted as saying in a very recent article, no guns, no bans, no compromise, period. He has no use for the Brady Bill. He has no use for waiting periods. He has no use for any kind of uh, firearms leg legislation at all. I think that the, the regulation fact of guns ought to at least be similar to the regulation of cars. I mean, if you agree that they should be there, and there are some of us who think fundamentally they're part of the problem, but even if you agree that they should be there, the regulation of the, of the machine, of the instrument, uh, ought to at least mirror what we do for cars. I, I think that any regulation, and I'm not saying that, that regulation, we've got 20,000 gun laws mm -hmm. in the United States today, which are not having an effect on the people we saw well, on the, the screen the, today. 20, 20, okay. But we have the youth under 21 can't buy a firearm, but you saw that they could all get them. Let's attack that problem. The fact is that we do spend a lot of time talking about guns and right. a whole lot less time talking about the underlying causes of all this. Right, don't we? right. I think, I think part of the problem in America is that we look at violence as that isolated bad guy violence over there. We have to look at the media, we have to look at guns, we have to look at what parents teach kids, what schools teach kids, it, all of that. I agree completely. I, I think what we're really talking about is some basic values, individual responsibility, treatment uh, in schools of basic human values. The culture has to have these kind of value, values to succeed. Part of my issue is separating out the sporting guns from the gun used to kill people. Who says that firearms have only a sporting purpose? I'm not going to sit here and say that. Firearms are used a million times a year in protecting and stopping crime. Handguns are used 645,000 times those, a year. Those are really speculative statistics. What we know is that if you have a gun, it is more likely to be used killing a friend, a, a child, a family member and what, than it is in any sort of, of protection. And, and what we know about that statistic is that it doesn't take into account the woman that's uh, shooting her abusing husband, or it doesn't take into account the drug deal gone well, wrong inside. Way, that's a wonderful way to solve half, the problem. You're absolutely right. It's a terrible home, way to solve the problem. The but let's homicides. not say that that's what the guns are doing. No, no, the no, guns no, aren't but causing But half that. of the homicides in the United States occur between friends and family. And a lot of those people are law-abiding people who have a gun in their home who get upset with each other or with a friend, who get in cycle, cycles of revenge. I mean, the presence of a gun is part of the problem. Handguns are used to kill people. Well, let, me ask you, let me ask you each a question. As we, uh, we hope that this will generate a dialogue like this across America. Do you think that we're at a critical mass in America about the use of guns and the violent use of them to the point that we may begin to turn this around by the end of the decade? Mr. Stilwell first. Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, I think that a dialogue like this, and more importantly, with the news media and manufacturers and some sociologists and doctors who can sit down and actually analyze the data, is, is a very intelligent way to look at things and go after what are the root cause. The root cause and, and the root solution is to take guns away from those people who are misusing them, and that's not the average American. Colonel, what do you think? Well, I would agree the sense that we'd like to take guns out of the wrong hands. I mean, I don't think there's any question of that. I think guns are not necessarily the problem. They are part of the problem. There's no way to get away from that. What I would like to see is a, a sense of responsibility amongst the shooters to find that middle ground. I'd like to see the corporate involvement. You had a wonderful piece on there about the uh, uh, Omega Boys Club. I would like to see some of that manufacturing dollars go to that as opposed to safety training on the range. That's the I think if we look at the problem of American violence as a public health problem, we begin to look at guns and reducing their availability. We start looking at children and the options that they need. The issues that poverty raises for children include the lack of healthy options, the lack of healthy things to do. We look at the media and we say, violence is not funny, so let's stop making it look like it's funny. And then we begin to look at our individual lives and our relationships and how we handle anger. And we teach children the skills to handle anger because it's a normal part of life. Thank you all very much. I'll be back with a final thought in just a moment. Large screens and small. As the reality and the threat of violence have been spreading, our common reaction has been to look away or to build higher gates or to demand more jails. In the inner city, when there is black-on-black -black violence, or brown-on-brown, too few community leaders express their outrage with the same passion they reserve for police violence. In the majority community, too many leaders ignore the root causes of violence within the underclass 
until it spills over into their neighborhoods. Too many citizens of all neighborhoods believe the only answer is more guns, to kill more. Well, if we allow this vicious cycle to continue, we are killing the essence of this nation, to live free from fear. I'm Tom Brokaw. Good night. We don't have to go to Desert Storm. We got the war right here. In Oakland, there have been a record number of homicides, more than 90 since January. Many have been committed by juveniles. America's infatuation with violence may have started with the media. Go ahead. Make my day. But it quickly spread to the top. Go ahead. Make my day. Dan Howard and his family realize guns in the wrong hands are tearing a hole in society. My feelings about the NRA is that sometimes they can be a little bit overboard. And it's hard for me to think that the American people will ever let our cowboy heritage die.